The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. That's always the first greeting in my house growing up as a child. And this morning I was a little groggy when I saw Mom it was before 6 a.m. Uh, but she called out that the Lord is risen, and I said, He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. What a glorious, incredible, <laughs> wonderful, awesome, and amazing fact of history. Christ is risen indeed. And if Christ is indeed risen, then that means that everything that Jesus said is true. Everybody say that word with me. True. true. Yes, there is such a thing as truth. There is such a thing as truth. And because Christ is risen, everything he said is truth. Check this out. I am the way and the truth and the life. True. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus true. said. True. Because of the resurrection, we know it is true. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. True. true. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. True. true. All these things we know are true because of the historical reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If that one fact about Jesus' life and ministry is true, that he truly conquered death, that Easter Sunday really happened, then we can know with a certainty that he is exactly who he says he is. He is who he claims to be, and he can do what he does and claims to do. His victory is our assurance. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, he mixes no words with the Corinthian church and with us today as we read these Holy Spirit-inspired words. 1 Corinthians 15, 19, he says, If in this life... Only we have hope in Christ. We are of all people most to be pitied. In other words, if there is no resurrection of the dead, if we have no hope beyond the grave, if this is all there is and then just nothingness, if Jesus himself died and stayed dead, there is no resurrection, he says we have no hope. And in fact, we as Christians are to be pitied the same way that someone would Pity someone who believes in a, a fable and a fairy tale and builds their life around that. Because we, those of us who trust in Jesus, have built our life upon the rock-solid foundation of the risen Lord and Savior. But I'm glad the story doesn't end there, for it says, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. First fruits means the first and the best. But it also means the first with promise of more to come. And so we who trust in Christ will be part of that in times harvest of the resurrection. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. All right, quick Bible trivia, okay? Here we go. Actually, it's not very trivial. Let's see if you can get this. Who was the man by whom death came? What was his Adam. name? Adam. And who is the man, capital M, by whom comes resurrection life? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The scripture says, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, As in Adam all die, so also in Christ. Everybody say those two words. In Christ. So also in Christ shall all be made alive. Alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, and then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So, if Christ is not risen, then everything he said is a lie, an error, a terrible and tragic mistake at best, a despicable and dangerous deception at worst. But if Christ is raised, then we in Christ are saved, sealed, and secure forever in him. So brothers and sisters, my friends today, it all comes down to Easter. No, I'm not talking about the holiday and all the trimmings. We had a little Easter egg hunt yesterday. There were a couple of Easter bunnies that were standing along Montrose waving to people, inviting people in. Why do we do that? Because we believe in Easter bunnies and eggs? Well, cover your ears, some of you, but no, not because we believe in the Easter bunny. It's because we believe in Jesus. And we know that people in our neighborhoods, 
they like the holiday traditions and the fun, and we're all about traditions and fun, so we can have people come in here and have a great time, but then we want to tell them about Jesus. That's the point. That's the point. It all comes down to Easter Sunday, to the perfect life, sacrificial death, resurrection victory of Jesus Christ. Easter really is a matter of life and death and life again. And I'm here to boldly say once again, the Lord is risen. He is risen. Hey, we're catching on. Give yourself a round of applause. I want to tell you personally, all right, personally, just man to man or man to woman or child or whatever, I built my entire life around the fact and reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If what we're celebrating today did not happen, then I'm the biggest fool who has ever lived. I've staked not only my life, but my eternal destiny on the reality of Resurrection Sunday, of Easter Sunday. By faith, Yes, of course. I walk by faith and not by sight. By experience? Yes. By experience. I know he lives because, as the song says, he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. So I know, I know by faith. I know by personal and daily experience. But our faith also has reason. Our faith also has good reason. It's reasonable to believe that the tomb is empty, and the only reason why it is empty is because the Savior has conquered. The Savior who died is the Lord who lives, so our faith has reason. And let me just share very, very briefly some of those reasons. First of all, there's prophecy, ancient prophecy, many, many hundreds of years before Christ, pointing forward to what would happen, even Christ himself, during his ministry, predicting that he would go to Jerusalem, that he would be betrayed, that he would be tried, that he would be treated cruelly, he would be crucified, buried, and on the third day he would rise again. We have the apostles, the disciples, those who actually were eyewitnesses. John said that the things they write of which are the things they have seen with their eyes and they've heard with their ears and their hands have touched. We're talking about real experience. They were eyewitnesses. And they boldly proclaimed the reality of what they saw. Even to the point of death, they would not turn from their eyewitness proclamation that the resurrection really happened. Christ really died and he really appeared. You say, well, wait a minute. Didn't he just appear to some weeping woman outside a tomb in a garden? Maybe she couldn't see through her tears. Maybe she wanted it so bad that she thought it happened, and then she spread the story, and everybody said, oh, cool, and they were all wanting it. No, none of them were prepared for Jesus to be raised. They were all running scared. They were all doubtful of the reality of it. And Scripture says he not only appeared to this weeping woman outside the tomb, he appeared on multiple occasions to his disciples and even to 500 people at one time. When the Apostle Paul wrote his letter to the Corinthians, he said that many of those 500 were still alive. And he said, look, if you don't believe me, go interview them. Go ask them. They'll tell you. They'll confirm that they saw the resurrected Christ. Another reason the tomb was empty. Why? There was no body. Why? Had there been a body in the tomb, what would have happened? The religious leaders would have paraded it through town. And the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Jewish religious leaders, they could have put down this whole Christian error right away. That's what they thought of. It was just a, an error, a twisting of the truth of Scripture. They could have put it down right away had they brought out the body of Jesus and paraded it through the streets and said, oh, this is your risen Christ? Look, he's still here. He was crucified. He's dead. But there was no body. The tomb is empty. Those who doubt the resurrection, you need to come up with your own explanation as to why the tomb was empty and as to why the disciples would say they witnessed the resurrected Christ and would not turn back their testimony even to the point of death. 
There's the burial cloth, the linen, neatly folded. Eyewitness testimony tells us, not the work of grave robbers. And how could they have robbed the tomb? A, a huge stone weighing multiple tons, rolled in front, sealed with a Roman seal. Anybody who broke it would be put to death. Guards placed out front, trained guards before it. And the greatest demonstration of all, the greatest demonstration today of the risen life of Jesus Christ, the followers of Jesus, those who bear his name, the verdict that demands the greatest evidence, that gives the greatest evidence, and that demands a verdict is the changed life of Christ's followers. How they have gone from fear to faith. The original disciples were hiding out, afraid. But then after they meet Jesus, after they see the resurrected Christ, what is Peter doing? Boldly proclaiming Jesus. Not behind closed doors, but in the very temple courts for all to see and hear. He doesn't care if he gets arrested. He doesn't care if he goes to jail. He doesn't care if he's put to death. Because Jesus is alive. From hiding to going public, from running scared to boldness unto death. They even changed the day of worship. Still gathering on the Sabbath, as they all did as good Jewish men and women, they began to meet on the first day of the week. And they called it the Lord's Day. Why? Why would they do that? Because Jesus triumphed over the grave on Easter Sunday. All of the evidence points to one incredible reality. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. Say those three words with me. Jesus is alive. Now, in the time remaining, I'd like to take a step back from the joy and wonder of the empty tomb and consider the stark reality of Calvary for a moment. Let's return to Good Friday. After Golgotha, the place of the skull, atop that place, three crosses stand tall against the morning sun. Let's consider this morning three lives that led to three crosses that led to two destinations. Luke chapter 23. If you've got your Bibles, please turn there. Luke 23, verse 32. We're going from the joy of resurrection Sunday back, turning the page back from Sunday to Friday morning to consider... What happened? Because I want to make sure everybody understands what Jesus did on the cross, why he did it, and how it applies to you. Why it is important for you to know and to personally receive for your own life. Luke chapter 23, verse 32 says this. Two others who were criminals... Sometimes they're noted as robbers, sometimes as insurrectionists or revolutionaries, but two others were led away to be put to death with him, with whom? With Jesus. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, sounds like an appropriate place for crucifixions and executions, doesn't it? The place of the skull, Golgotha. There they crucified Jesus and the criminals. One on his right and one on his left. Now, interestingly, Matthew and Mark tell us that both of the criminals were joining with the crowd in furling insults upon Jesus. And, and maybe that's exactly what happened, but I wonder, I wonder. Luke gives the most detailed account of the birth narratives of Jesus, doesn't he? Many people think that Dr. Luke as a person putting together an orderly account of Jesus' life, had such detailed records of the birth of Christ because he interviewed Mary, the mother of Jesus, herself. Could it be that the details in this section that he provides are because he interviewed Mary, the mother, who was one of the few followers of Jesus, at this point, courageous enough to be at the foot of the cross? Because Dr. Luke gives us a little detail about these two criminals that we don't see elsewhere. It says in verse 34, Jesus' first words from the cross. He said, Father, judge them. 
for they're all a bunch of ungrateful jerks. <laughs> Is that what Jesus said? No. 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 He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, he saved others. Oh, so they were watching. They did see Jesus do all those miracles of healing and saving people and delivering them from demons. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah, the Christ of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was also an inscription over him saying, quote, This is the king of the Jews. Amen. Now, it's likely that Pilate put that inscription above the cross as a way to mock not so much Jesus, but the religious leaders and the people of Jerusalem. But little did he know that he was publishing the first gospel tract about Jesus for all to read. And I wonder if the positioning of the cross wasn't such that one of the men... The criminals being crucified was able to look toward Jesus on the center cross and see that inscription above his head and hear what the people were saying. Wait, who is this guy? Wait, this is the miracle worker? He saved others? He healed others? He delivered others? Wow. And he starts taking a second look at Jesus and considering his life as it compares to the life of Jesus. And something begins to change in his heart, but the, the person on the other side, he's hardened his heart towards God. And in his suffering, rather than being softened, his heart is hardened. Isn't it amazing how suffering and trial can do that? For some people, we go through trials, we go through difficulties, we get sick, we experience loss, hardship happens, it breaks us down, it hurts but we draw closer to Jesus in the process. And on the other side, we give thanks for the fiery trial and for the work that it's done to bring us closer to God. But if you notice in many people's lives, it has just the opposite effect. And it serves not to push them closer to Christ, but to push them further away. The difference, of course, is faith and our relationship to Jesus. And so the story continues now, and this is the detail that Luke provides that we don't hear about in the other Gospels. Could it be that, that Mary, standing at the foot of the cross, was able to hear this interchange whispered between dying men? One of the criminals who hanged there railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. He joined in with all those mocking Jesus on the center cross. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do, do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? We indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man, this man has done nothing wrong. And then he looked to Jesus and he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, this very day, you will be with me. In paradise. Amen. Let's consider the three crosses for a moment. First of all, three lives. In the center, we have the Savior who came from God to live a perfect life. The will of the Father to satisfy and to fulfill the requirements of the law. And to give his life as a willing 
perfect, once for all, final sacrifice in our place and on our behalf. We have on the center cross the sinless Savior. Next to him we have the sinner. The man who has committed sins throughout his life. We don't know his backstory, do we? Some of you watched a movie here on Wednesday called The Penitent Thief that goes into the backstory of, of these guys on either side of Jesus. But we don't really know the backstory. What is it that leads someone into a life of crime? Was it childhood trauma? Was it abuse? Was it severe lack and wants at home? Was it family starvation? Was it a death of parents at a young age? We don't know. Whatever it was that led him to a life of crime, he probably had justified it and made excuses. But in this moment, just hours from death, he knew there were no excuses left for him. And he was honest about his sin. He feared God. He knew that justice was being executed against him, that he was receiving the due reward for what he had done, the crimes he had committed. And so we have the sinner, the honest sinner. On the other side, we have the scoffer. The scoffer. Not the sinner with a softened heart, but the scoffer with a hardened heart. Who's angry at everyone. Angry at those crucifying him. Angry at the victims of his crimes who turned him in. Angry at life. Angry at those who failed him as a child. Angry and accusing and excusing himself. Angry even at the man next to him, the sinless Savior, suffering and dying and struggling for each breath. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. The scoffer joins in with the crowds. And so we move from three lives to three crosses. Think about what each cross signifies. The center cross is the cross of redemption. The cross of redemption. It's Jesus, the Redeemer. What does it mean to redeem something? What's another word for redeem? Anybody know? Purchase. Purchase or to buy. Buy. So, in a sense, if I have a gift card that somebody gives me for the holiday, and I want to redeem that gift card at Chili's, one of our family's favorite restaurants, right? A little here at Chili's, all right? We've got, some, we've got some Chili's folks here today. Okay, Chili's, if I take my gift card to Chili's, I, that gift card, if I eat it, it's not going to do me much good, is it? No. But I can redeem that gift card for chips and salsa. And I can redeem that gift card for a triple dipper. And I can redeem that gift card for some... You guys are all getting hungry, aren't you? Nah, Who's going to Chili's after church? All right. So I can redeem that gift card, and I get something wonderful in return, temporarily satisfying. So Jesus, he went to the cross to purchase our salvation, to buy us, to redeem us from sin, from slavery to sin to be sons of God. That's what it means to be redeemed, to be purchased. He paid the purchase price at the cross. Now, you can say, you know what? Thank you, Jesus, but I'll pay the price myself. I've used this story before. Maybe you're not familiar with it. Jesus, as he's praying in the garden, says, Father, if it be your will, take this cup from me. What's he talking about, this cup? He didn't really have a cup in his hand. He was talking about the cup of suffering. Imagine here before me in two cups. One is full and the other is empty. The full cup represents the wrath of God that you and I have incurred, and it'll take us all eternity to pay the price. So you want to drink that cup on your own? No. It's going to take all eternity in the place that Jesus calls hell. The other cup is empty. It's the cup that Jesus drank on the cross. It's the cup of suffering. It's the cup that he paid for us, that he drank for us to the very dregs. And so you have a choice to make. In your pride and rebellion, you can drink the cup of God's wrath for all eternity, or you can humble yourself, confess your sin, and claim Jesus as your Redeemer, your Savior. The choice is yours. Jesus 
suffers and dies on the cross of redemption. The second cross is the cross of repentance. This is the penitent sinner who is sorry for his sins, who is honest about his sins, who turns from his sin and turns to the Redeemer. That's what repentance is all about. It's a change. It's walking one way and changing, saying, I'm sick of my life of sin. I'm turning in faith to the Savior. That's the cross of repentance. And the third cross, not the softened heart of the sinner turning in repentance, but the hardened heart of the scoffer hardened into his rebellion. Rebellion against God. And he says, I don't care if it takes me all eternity to pay the price and drink the cup. I do not want what you have to offer Jesus. The sinless Son of God gives his life as a once-for-all sacrifice. And the hardened heart of rebellion, the scoffer says, I don't want any part of it. Jesus, I don't want what you have to offer. So we have three crosses. Jesus is the Redeemer, but I wonder, are you the sinner who turns from sin and repentance, or are you the scoffer who makes fun, who makes light, who makes jokes, and hardens your heart in rebellion? Well, there may be three people, three crosses, but there are two destinations. Jesus says to the sinner who turns to him in repentance, the sinner who simply says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus says, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. When today, that very day, to be absent from the body is to be immediately present with the Lord. No soul sleep, no purgatory, to be immediately present with the Lord. Today you will be with me in paradise. This man had lived his whole life far from God, yet in the final moments turns to Jesus in faith. You say, that's not fair. Pastor Jason, didn't you start following Jesus when you were a little boy? I did, very young. And there were many pleasures of this world I've had to say no to because I was a follower of Jesus. You say, well, that's not fair. This guy, he had his fun. Then at the very end, he turns to Jesus. That's not fair. Guess what? It's not fair for any of us. It's not fair for any of us to receive forgiveness. It's not fair for any of us to have our sin debt canceled. It's not fair for any of us to be welcomed into paradise and into heaven. What's fair is for each one of us to suffer justly for our sin and to suffer eternally. For our sin. That's what's fair. So this guy at the end of his life turns to Jesus and Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. That's one option. Eternal life with Jesus. With Jesus. I can't tell you exactly what it'll be like. The Bible gives us some description. We're going to have a resurrected body. There'll be no more short circuits. It's not going to get old. It's not going to get tired. We'll run. We won't grow weary. We'll walk. We won't be faint. I don't know. It says we're going to mount up with wings like eagles. I don't know if that's just symbolic or if we're actually going to fly around. I'm not sure exactly. Time and space won't have the same limitations on us. We're going to have a resurrected body just like that of Jesus. I'm so glad that in the Gospels it describes Jesus as eating. I mean, he really eats and seems to enjoy food. I'm looking forward to enjoying the, the fruit of the tree of life and all that resurrection life has to offer. No more weeping, no more crying, no more mourning, no more pain. Here at Montrose, these resurrection, this Resurrection Sunday, these Easter lilies remind us of loved ones who have passed away and are no longer with us. And yet this is Resurrection Sunday. A celebration of life. And so we give thanks to God for the hope that we have in Christ. A reunion with those who have gone before us. And so for the softened heart of the sinner who turns to Jesus in repentance and faith. And invites, asks Jesus to be his Savior. Jesus says, you'll experience life with me. The moment your eyes close in death here on earth, it will open in the presence of Jesus 
in paradise. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now there's a second destination. And maybe this passage doesn't bring it to life, but the scripture is very clear. The second destination is what Jesus tells in another story. He calls it torments, a horrible place. And while paradise is eternal life with Jesus, torment is eternal death apart from Jesus. There are no second chances. We are destined to die once, and after that comes judgment. I take back what I just said. <laughs> You can have second, third, fourth, fifth chances as long as your heart's still pumping and there's still air in your lungs. But scripture says that after death, there are no second chances. After death comes judgment. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. What a wonderful, wonderful promise. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. If you don't understand that saying, I'll say it again, but I'm not going to explain it to you. I want you to think about it. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. So two options. Jesus remains who he is, whether you choose him or not. Whether you receive him or not. He is the Savior. He is the Redeemer. But you have two options. Which option will you choose? The sinner or the scoffer? The cross of repentance and following Jesus or the cross of of rebellion, the destination of paradise, or the destination of torment. The choice is yours. I'd like to invite you, uh, Raymond's going to play for us.